Hi folks, welcome to Sunday's I Write Radio podcast, stroke video cast. Uh, no politics again, because apparently Holyrood still isn't open. So Mr. Brewer doesn't need to be on the telly um, until Westminster opens. It being a Scottish political program. Uh, we'll, we'll do a newspaper report and I dare say there'll be one or two other things to drop in. Uh, Ian McQuarter, Andrew uh, Ronsley, Martin Hannan, um, all have pieces that we're going to discuss and I've no doubt there'll be others. But let's kick off with McQuarter, shall we? Hello there, I'm here. My name's Stuart. <laughs> okay, ego stroke. Stuart Lockhead's here, Jimmy Hunt's here, and Norrie Stewart's here. There's a good start. Uh, McQuarter's piece in The Herald. He seems to have finally put one foot on one side of the fence he sits on. Not completely off the fence about independence. But his, his last line was um, interesting. Give me a second while I dig it out. Uh, here we go. You're gonna... Perhaps Jer should really stand for get out while the going's good, meaning get out of the UK while the going's good. Yep. He's got that one article. There's half a dozen quotes we could have used. Hmm. Um, Scotland, uh, with eight percent of the UK population, accounts for nearly sixty percent of the entire UK deficit. That just doesn't make sense, says Ian. He's just jumping on the bandwagon. He's jumping on the bandwagon that people have taken turned their noses up at Jers this year to be told that we've got a fifteen billion deficit when Rishi Sunak blowing three hundred billion that he's just created is thin air as a nonsense. People see it as a nonsense, and. God only knows how many hacks have decided that they can go with the phrase it's a bit of a nonsense this year. Because it's a, it is a shame say, that they didn't criticise the, the QE bailout of the banks 10 years ago, isn't it? Mm, aye. It's the same argument. Um, it's, exact, it's the exact same argument with Stuart. Let's create money and make sure that we can cipher as much as of that money that we've just created as possible. Pounds into the pockets of the rich, huh? Uh, the pals. There's a the piece, um, Professor Robertson's site oh, did wow. a, a short piece, not in depth at all, but pointed out that Jers was produced in 92, and mm. between 92 and 98, it had nothing to do with the Scottish Parliament, because obviously we didn't have a Scottish Parliament. However, we still ran deficits, according to Westminster, when Westminster were in charge. Mm. Uh, I, I really do. This year's been a bit of a watershed, as I think I said yesterday. Uh, sorry, Friday. I have noticed the last couple of years there's been this change about jairs. About, yeah, okay, whose fault is it? It now seems this year that the mainstream media have finally caught up with the yes movement's questions about jairs. I know I'd agree with you, but it's noticeable that not a single one of them is questioning Jackie Bailey, Richard Leonard, Murdo Fraser, even Douglas Ross and Ruth Davidson, when they come out and bang the jairs drum, because they're the ones that are going to continually bang it, even when they're not producing jairs anymore, they'll make things up about deficits. Uh, it's, it's a shame and they're no, they're no, they're not holding their feet to the fire in the way that they held or they attempted to hold the SNP's feet to the fire over the last ten years of Jairs. Oh, because with the Jairs, of course, figures have been designed. If we could even quote Ian Lang, Secretary of State for Scotland. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Jairs figures were designed to stop devolution happening, let alone independence. Well, that kind of brings us. Um, onto the, sorry, I'm losing the plot here. <laughs> I wouldn't have worried about it, mate, it's Sunday. You know um, but the, the idea that uh, Fuchs came out with, that the opposition parties should mm. be allowed a platform like Nicola Sturgeon's. 
Oh, right, because uh, he, she's on the, t on the telly nearly every day. And well, uh, well, this idea that basically you brought up, Stuart, that none of the opposition parties are being questioned about anything. And why Fuchs thinks it would be an advantage to them to stand in front of the hyena pack day in, day out the hyena to answer pack questions. Wouldn't, they wouldn't pick on the opposition. Uh, they never they, do. They just wouldn't. I mean, we've we seen that last week. There's been not one Tory, not one questioned about the hostile environment that led to another asylum seeker dying in Glasgow last week. Oh, it's one, been headlined they, as... But uh, they've, been allowed, they've been allowed to evince sympathy and say what a tragedy it was. And not one of them has been asked about it. And it's their party that's created it. Their party that spent the last 10 years vilifying asylum seekers to the point where they're... <laughs> They're dying, and questions are still not asked. Well, it's now a Scottish and uh, a, a UK problem, according to the papers. Aye, that bint Garavelli had a piece this morning on Twitter, but she's now got her Twitter shut off to people commenting. I couldn't even ask the simple question. If you think it's such a disgrace, why have you asked no Tories to comment in your entire article? So it's, her position is what? That the Scottish government should do something about well, it? Her, her position is that the Scottish government and the UK government should work together to make sure that there is not a hostile environment. How can you really work together? How can you possibly work with a Tory government that's created the hostile environment to change the hostile environment? Uh, uh, they love it. They absolutely adore it. My God, half of them retweeted Nigel Farage sitting on a beach with a telescope last week. That's how sick these people are. Uh, not very good. There is one angle on the, the whole Jers angle, which is like, yes, even if you accept that maybe 10 of the 15 billion is real, if you look at it from a UK perspective, the only place that seems to run a surplus is London and the southeast of England. Every English region, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, according to the Jers figures, runs a deficit. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it's, it, and there is a good article about which explains. I think it was a reference by Richard Murphy, which it, and it was written two or three years ago. It explains just how they work it in London. You know, even if they've got, even if they spend money, right? They come up with some money and say you can have a new school in Liverpool, but that's going to be a PFI contract, and the the the, the company that gets the contracts, the consultants, the builder, and everything else, it's all based in London. And so the actual well, the, profit all goes to, goes to London, not to, the, 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 to Liverpool. The best mm -hmm. explanation I've heard is, is to use the MOD. The MOD buys 10 cars on behalf of Scotland. Three of them are used in Scotland. Seven of them are used in various other parts of the UK, popping into Scotland occasionally. All the VAT from the fuel um, for that is UK Treasury mm -hmm. money. So you don't see a benefit in, on Scotland's books. All the work done on those cars, on those seven cars, is done somewhere else other than Scotland. So the tax the mechanic pays doesn't show on Scotland's books. Aye. However, the capital cost of the cars is allocated to Scotland. It's just, it's, it's false accountants, mate. It's false, false mm -hmm. accountancy. Um, and writ large, and Whitehall are, are experts at it. They've done it for a century and a half with London. Sorry, with, with India. They've done it for a couple of centuries with Ireland. Mm -hmm. A couple of centuries with us, and then decided, oh, hold it, we better stop producing figures for Scotland because the Irish took a look at the figures and have had a revolution. Um, and at the end of the day, they know how much value comes out of Scotland and goes vile the books of London into the coffers of the United Kingdom. Well, here's, here's the question that uh, nobody seemed to have asked. I don't mean if just us three. Um, if it's true that, what, that uh, the English regions, anywhere north and west of London, is losing out by the current system, when are they going to waken up in Manchester and, uh, and Leeds in particular? Well, I think they are waking up. I, th I think that's what the whole... Um, level up bullshit's about. Right, you don't want levelling up. Levelling up doesn't work. That's like a yeah. high contract. The money's still exactly. going to London. No, no, no. I'm not saying it works, Stuart. What I'm saying is that's, that's, that, that's the PR spin that Westminster puts on it. 
I remember we had we had what seven or eight years in Northern Powerhouse. Nothing changed in the north. Mm-hmm. Come on, I mean, there's been massive investment to Manchester. Take a look at Manchester City Centre. There's been huge investment, and like Stuart says, like well, no, all the profit for that goes straight into the books at London because everybody's got their brass plaque in London. And it, the only and thing it, they've succeeded in doing in Manchester is pushing Mancunians further out for the city centre because none of them can afford to live there anymore. Uh, and, and, it's, and it doesn't stop just at the time of the investment. It stays there. Don't forget, PFI contracts last 25 or 30 years. That money keeps going to London. Aye, and all the land, Stuart, all the landlords, all these people, these buildings that are done up or these new buildings that are put up, all the landlords are based in London. So again, all the profit goes there. It's, it's a remarkable system, but... You can see why they'd never change it. It's worked yeah, well, for them for centuries. But we need to persuade the likes of what's his, who was the mayor of Manchester? He seems to be high profile. Uh, Andy Burnham. Burnham. Andy Burnham. Yeah. He seems to be quite uh, prepared to take on London. He's uh, more of, he's, to be honest, he's more of an opposition leader than uh, Keir Starmer. I, I'd agree with you, mate. But unfortunately, I think the only way that they'll ever make any real change in England is after we're gone and we are a success after a 10 years or whatever, and they start to say, they start to ask serious questions of why London has hamstrung them in the exact same way that it did to Scotland for centuries. Well, I think once, once we're off the top of the great list, that gives Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle the opportunity to take the top spot. Hmm. I mean, some you money. At, as I say, Yorkshire, Yorkshire's the breadbasket of England. The kind of food manufacturing that goes on in there and again, all these big companies, that profit will be listed to London. Because you don't think for a second that, that the largest biscuit factory on the planet has actually got a brass plaque in Leeds. <laughs> Not a chance. Okay. Um, Ronsley Stewart, you wanted to speak about his no, article. No, I don't have no, Stuart had it. Me that, it no, was I me. I know nothing that. about it. Aye, but Stuart, it's a, it's a good one to have a look at this afternoon, mate. It's right. just, it's basically saying what we've been saying since, God, time immemorial, but certainly since Dominic Cummings and Boris appeared on the scene, that, that they're, they're deliberately tearing up the rules. They, they're happy to be seen to tear up the rules of government. They think they're doing something different, but all they're actually doing is making sure that everybody gets the blame bar they how even Gavin Williamson can be the biggest horse's ass in a cabinet of horse's butts. And he has to take no responsibility for that because Boris absolutely does not want any ministers being responsible for he's, anything. He's, he's, he's not he's the worst. Surely Chris Grayling is the worst. Aye, oh, but Grayling, Grayling gets to fail as much as he wants, mate. I mean, to be honest, the, the way that Gip Williamson's been lately he makes Grayling look efficient. And then but, Dido, Dido Harding, as she called or something. Aye, it's it's. But they reward, they reward failure. They pay them well. They keep them. There's no chance Williamson, Williamson might lose his job eventually. But do any of us think that he'll not get another cabinet post in a few months' time? It seems to be the qualification for high office is loyalty, mm-hmm. or competence. But I mean, it is worse. I mean, look, what it's what they're doing. What the Cummings plan is quite clearly is to. Uh, weaken the, the the legal system, weaken Parliament, weaken the civil servants. Uh, they just they, they they want to it's giving all power is being centralised within government. I I think that they could be making a really big mistake with the attack on the civil service, because they don't exactly look like a hard working bunch of guys. Who do they actually think does the work? to implement policy. It's the civil service. They yeah. fall out with the civil service and one week yep. turns into 10. Yeah, but not yet. Nothing I would have ag- done. I'd have agreed with you maybe six months or a year ago before this bunch came in. But they, you know, that some senior civil servants that might have defended the civil service have gone already. Yeah, but I, I'm yeah. talking about the everyday Joe that takes twice as long to get to the photocopier. If they if they end up alienating the civil service, the work will not be finished. They'll not well, get got, it done. Uh, you've got within the civil service, you've got some pretty strong trade unions. I didn't mean that they they're going to go on strike or whatever. What I'm saying is they might just have a quiet word amongst their members, 
And if the civil service decides to work to rule, although Whitehall could grind to a halt fairly quickly, you've also got this guy who's suing Pretty Pretel. And he's no back he's no for backing down. If I was him, I would possibly employ a couple of mates as bodyguards, and I certainly wouldn't go for a walk in the woods on my own. Well, he refused a payoff. Aye, so, he's he, absolutely so he could take them to the payoff. tribunal. And that is not going to... I mean, we've all heard the rumours about Pretty Patel. It's not just been one civil servant. It's been virtually every civil servant that she's worked with has had problems with her. So that, when that finally gets to the tribunal and he finally sits in a court, that's not going to be well for the, this government. Yes, what but was... that, if that happens, if they emasculate the courts for uh, judicial review... Can you not see them emasculating uh, employment tribunals as well? Uh, sorry, they've already done it. Have they? Cost you a thousand pound to go to an employment tribunal now. Eighty odd percent drop in number of tribunals. Basically, you've got to be rich enough not to need a job to go to a tribunal to protect your job. Okay, I've added that to my list of the attack on the law, parliament, the civil service, and now tribunals. Okay. Oh, that that was done under. Cameron, I think. It was years uh, ago. <coughs> right, now you remind me, yeah, I think you're right. Aye, it was the no, same, no. aye, because the, the, it was the same, it was the Cameron government that messed about with legal aid and made it far more difficult to get legal aid in certain situations as well. And it shut down all the courts so that his mates uh, wouldn't have to go to court because there wouldn't be and, any. And privatised the probation service that turned into the worst privatisation in the oh. history of this country and let's be honest we've had some bad privatisations well, that, that, that was that was a Chris Grilling one was it wasn't that our government in waiting circle or was it group four uh, I, I think you might be right mate I think circle were up to their ears in that one but um realized it was too difficult basically and handed the uh, they didn't hand the money back but they handed the contract back you know, but, the circus got contracts in Australia as well. Goodness knows, probably all over America too, for all we know. Well, we're, apparently there's a revolving door between the fascist governments of Australia and our own fascist governments. Now. <laughs> Sorry, here's another one. Yeah. Are you talking about Tony Abbott by any chance? Uh, oh, gosh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Second-rate politician from Australia gets a job in, from this M government in, in the misogynist UK. Misogynist, racist, second-rate politician. Right. What, a, what a surprise. Hmm. Unbelievable. It's quite, it's, it, it defies belief. I mean, it, it, we've said in the past as well that it, there's no longer any consequences for lying. So the Ronsley article clearly points out Michael Gove says all the right things about honour amongst politicians and duty and all this stuff, but you can say them all you want. Your government is absolutely trampling all over whatever you say. And the fact that he can say that with a straight face makes him lower than a snake's belly. And if Johnson has problems, we must we must ensure that Michael Gove never, ever becomes Prime Minister. I thought his comment, I would, I've always sort of struggled to put a handle on, on Gove, but that um, philosopher Prince comment he made, mm. Michael Gove really does think he's a bit of an intellectual specialist. It does, mate. And the reality is he's a cross between Francis Urquhart and Alan Bastard. He's the worst of both of those characters jammed together. And he's got that horrific message of his back and every word he says and whispering in his ear, you're brilliant, you're wonderful. Well, between him and bloody... I tweet, sorry, between her and Rupert Murdoch, he must think he's king of the world. Never mind Boris. Right, well, that's, Boris is a, a, that says the Good danger, one. of course. Sarah Vine, you know, she, she's like still... In the, in the pay of Rupert Murdoch. And oh, of course, Rupert Murdoch is now be, apparently behind, going to be behind a new TV channel, or a news TV channel we're going to get, which is going to be Britain's equivalent of Fox. Wonderful. I wonder if, I wonder if you'll give Messi's a job. That's oh. a proposal. There's another one. What is it? TVGB or something? No, it's the same one. Uh, the same same I, thought Murdoch, I thought Murdoch wasn't involved in that. I thought that was the ex BBC guy. No, no, they've already Mur got an Ofcom license. Mur Murdoch's no, no longer got a majority stake in Sky News, and they're not happy how they rank Sky News as far too left wing, uh, as well as the, the BBC. So this is why they're starting the, their equivalent of Fox. I mean, it's quite amazing. It's amazing how many right wingers in this country think the press is left wing. 
You know what I mean? I would never in my in my life say the UK press has ever been left wing. I would no, never say no that you're wing. no that you're anything but a solid down the middle kind of guy, Jimmy. No, but I wouldn't say they're even middle of the road, mate. Even the BBC, I wouldn't say they're middle of the road. I think the BBC maybe were middle of the road in the seventies because. And to my recollections, I think they criticised governments of both sides probably equally. I think during the Thatcher years that started to change a bit. But yeah. when you look back, you couldn't tell that, say, a John Cole, for example, you would, mm. didn't know what John Cole's politics was. He ripped them all apart. You know exactly That's where true. a Nick Robinson or a um, Laura Koonsberg or that, where they Andrew, stand now. Andrew Neil. Mm hmm. <laughs> See, I, I still, I'm sorry, I'm going to defend Andrew Neil when he does get one of them in front of them, whatever colour they are, he does go for the jugular. Yeah, yeah but, but his own, but 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 his own politics works. are extreme right, so... Yeah, but when he's doing his job, I'm sorry, he, he, he asks hard questions of them all. And it actually quite annoys me that people don't give him that respect. He can be at times, especially when he had his own show, he could shall we say, bully the left a bit more than the right. You mean that wasn't not the Andrew Neil show? It certainly wasn't not the Andrew Neil show. <laughs> um, now, Stuart, you mentioned the law. Martin Hannan, and this is one for Jimmy as well, of course, because um, Jimmy brought this up the other day. We have what uh, speculation, this is the headline, speculation that Dominic Cummings is behind the law grab. We've got the power grab. Now we've got the law grab. And we covered this briefly the other day. But um, Martin Hannon has got a very interesting article about that. And he links together what Jimmy did the other day that um, for some reason, rather than, we'll, we'll just call it the ineptitude of the Lord Advocate, Frank Mulholland, and uh, now Judge Lord Mulholland, and the Lord Advocate, James Wolfe, with regard to the Rangers uh, liquidation case. Uh, and he goes on to, co to go, over, go on about the false commission, the possible act of union that's going to come through Westminster or, um, in the new year. They're going to replace the treaty by an act of, a new act of union to try and... Anyway, the no, lawyer... No, they're not. Not without fucking negotiations, they're not. Okay. And I want to be at the table. They want a new act of union. They renegotiate it. They do not get to pass it at Westminster. His, his quote is, the existence and preservation of Scots law was guaranteed by Article 19 of the Act of Union, and since then no government has dared to threaten what we might call the sovereignty of Scots law. Aye, aye. That's think, not um, really true. No, there's been, there's been nibbles at it. There's been nibbles over the years, but this is a full-out assault, and... I think they may back off, if I'm honest. I think the fact that you're going to unite, other than the Conservative Party, you would unite every other party in the Scottish Parliament immediately by attacking Scots law. You also unite the legal, the entire legal community in Edinburgh. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure this government's smart enough to get up the nose of the legal community of Edinburgh because I think they'd get torn apart fairly sharpish. I don't think there are, you know, guys like Michael Gove, Dominic Cummings, they think they are wonderful minds. But if they set themselves on a collision course with the, the top legal minds in Scotland, they will very quickly come off second best and they will yeah. very quickly realise they're coming off second best. Well, maybe, yeah. Look here, it says here, it's becoming vital in the UK, let alone Scotland, the judiciary stand up to the attempts to subvert the democracy. But in the light of the Lord Advocates, two of them transgressing in their duties, that mess must be cleared up in a hurry. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what, what I was saying on Friday, Stuart. I, um, there seems to be almost an impunity for a Lord Advocate to make an absolute pig's lug of things and there's no consequences to that. And that needs to stop. The Justice Secretary needs to step in there and say to Frank Mulholland, I know Frank Mulholland's a judge now and they're almost impossible to remove, but he needs to step in and say, why did you make these decisions? And if need be... Does he have the, the power to do that? No, I think, well, at the end of the day, mate, he's Justice Secretary. I know it's difficult. I know there's a delineation of powers there. 
But if they have failed in their duty, and this isn't just a small failure, mate, this could cost the Scottish government £20 million because they maliciously prosecuted two guys. If that's the case, then the Justice Secretary needs to say, look, you need to take early retirement. You need to step aside. You're not going to be given any serious cases. I will ensure, I will find a way to ensure that you will not be given a serious case as a judge ever again. So find a way to step down. I, I think the best he can do is ask for a resignation. I don't think he can fire him. I don't think he could fire him either, mate, but I'm pretty sure as a, as a Justice Secretary he could find ways to make his life untenable. Well, talking about the Justice Secretary, I discovered over the weekend that Alec called Hamilton is, good, is friends with Hamza Youssef. He did a little personal about how you can still be friends with other people in other parties in Parliament. Apparently they're buddies. Um, uh, well... Uh, if that's the case, then perhaps Hamza needs to... Wait a minute, a wait a minute. Case, what, yeah. what, I'm sorry, in the context of what? Does it matter who your friends are? Well, given that what we've seen in Alex Cole Hamilton's character, mate, yeah. Well, given that Alex Cole Hamilton is leading the charge uh, in the inquiry at the moment, he's certainly ahead of Jackie Bailey and uh, Murdo. He's not hard being ahead of Murdo. Um, and we need Hamza Yusuf's role to be dispassionate, I'll say. I'll use that word. I don't know. I, I, think, that's, I, I think that's maybe just... I'm not certain, but um, it could be part of a, a wee campaign here to um, do down people within the Scottish government, because there was certainly a lot of pushback. I don't know if any of you heard the interview that Kate Forbes done with the Guardian this weekend. It was a, a it was a podcast, and it was about half an hour long. And there's been a bit of pushback on that. Um, there was one journalist who had a pop at her for an interview that Nori that you played a clip of last week. The interview in Parliament saying that yeah, right. shouty women are never impressive, and that was roundly shouted down by quite a few people. I thought the Guardian journalist, when he, when he was interviewing her, is somebody we know, and I can't remember the guy's name, oh. but he, he, he spent a bit too long. Was it Severin, Severin Carroll? Carroll? No, it was. I didn't think it was. It was somebody else, guys. I, I, damn it, I wish I made a point out to you. Cause Libby, I I read... Brook, Libby Brooks? No, it's no one. Of, it's, it's a bloke. But oh. anyway, he spent a wee bit too long going on about her faith and comparing her faith to that the problems that... Um, the last Liberal Democrat leader before Joe Swinson had. Nick Farron, was it? Aye. I know the aye. one you mean. Farron. She's, she, the Cumbrian she's, fella. Aye, she's a, a, a wee free. And yeah. he was basically trying to get her to... He was trying to trip her up, you know, try to trip her up on abortion, try to trip her up on the hate crimes bill. And she dealt with it very, very well. But it's interesting to note that the moment anyone seems to be relatively successful as an SNP minister, there seems to be a slight campaign to get in about them and try and trip them up a wee bit. Do it early without realising by doing it early, you forearm them for Aye. a future career. Well, the, the thing is, mate, I, at the end of the day, I didn't, you can me, I didn't trust God bothers much. But I don't see people being a God botherer as any impediment whatsoever to being successful as a politician. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that, I think that um, people I, who try as, and use somebody else's faith against as, them. As long as you keep it secular, there shouldn't be any problem. Well, I think we're fortunate in that Scotland has, in my lifetime, Scotland has become a far more secular country. You know, uh, mm -hmm. when's the last time you heard the Bishop Tartaglia, for example, being asked for his opinion on a story of Scottish politics. It very rarely happens now. But It'd when, la it would be the last time that another bishop got done for aye, probably. playing with wee laddies. When, when, when Keith Wright was cardinal, he was never off the news, mate. They were asking his opinions on all kinds of stories. When who's cardinal, uh, Canyon, Kenyon Wright, 
he was constantly on the news being asked about this, that, and the next thing. The churches uh, are was, very rarely asked these uh, days. But he's, he, he was practically a... He was he had, well, he had a political position. He was chairman of the Constitutional Commission, wasn't he? Uh, uh, mm. And he was very, actually, uh, pretty left-wing, to be honest. And he was uh, uh, al almost, a, almost a secularist. I just think we're fortunate Scotland's become secular without really making a big deal of it. Well, you the see, Jimmy... Countries that make a big, a big deal about being secular countries like Israel clearly aren't secular. I think Holyrood needs a second chamber and we should fill it with industrialists and priests. Ah, right. And uh, <laughs> cardinals and whatever, because I do think that adds to democracy in no way. The only, th the only thing priests were ever industrial about me is something that we shouldn't talk about on air. <laughs> Um, okay. Anything else, anybody? Uh, what have we covered? John Drummond had um, a nice piece. He's been on about um, chairs again, to be honest. So it's, uh, John Drummond, um, he's got a radio show once a week on Indie Live. Uh, a friend of ours from way back. Um, he runs the Constitutional Commission or something. The Commission it's, on the Constitution. It's a think, it's a think, I think what you would call a think tank to uh, promote a constitution for an independent Scotland. The wingman, you could say, is Elliot Bulmer, who, who interestingly enough, has now become a god -bollerer. But uh, apart from that... Elliot was always a god -bollerer. Well, he's expressed it more publicly now. But um, <laughs> uh, he's another one that's looking at chairs and looking at modern monetary theory. Um, it's all, uh, is there a tipping point when it comes to the simple question, does, is the economy moving from being a, a, a low value card in the campaign for independence or is it becoming a positive for the independence campaign? It depends on the question you ask. Mm. I, I've now kind of moved my stance on this one to defending Scotland's economy to simply saying what the unionists said to us for the last 10 years. Of so, but you're not answering my question. So is there a typical well, point coming? No, I, I think it's arrived. I think we just haven't recognised it yet. I think we're beyond the point where it's advantageous to the union because the question now is, okay, you want us to stay in the union what are you going to do to get rid of the deficit you created while we were in the union? Because if you can't tell me how you're going to get rid of it, I want out of the union. That's a good question because that is part of the, the reason people like Ian McQuarter are sitting on the fence on the issue now. Well, I would suggest Ian McQuarter's ripped his breeks because he's fallen to one side. <laughs> he's not quite <laughs> centre of the fence now. He'll climb back up again. Well, he's Started in the middle of his article, there's drivel about more devolution. But the, by the end of the article, he's saying, time to go. Ah, but, but bear in mind his job. He works for the Herald. He's the political editor now. Ah, but see, Stuart, you didn't read the, bottom, the bit at the bottom from the Herald that says the opinions of the people that write in our paper have got nothing to do well, with us, pal. Yeah, but yes, well, that's, the, that's, that's one thing. But on the other side of the fence is the fact that he, is actually, he gets paid, presumably, extra money to be the political editor, not just a commentator. Mm. Well, I he seems to have definitely slipped a bit on his I foot. think it's interesting times for a lot of these journalists because, like we talked about last week, guys, as, as things march towards 60%, and... Well, is that at the point, point? Well, I think because so many of them in the past have mentioned 60% as, as a figure they never thought the independence movement would get to, I think there will be one or two of them that think it's time to break cover and think, think about their future. You know, I've got some of them maybe thinking, I've got 20 years to go before I can step away here. 15 years, how do I get away with I can't possibly slate the independence movement that we have been doing for the last 10 years or when you get to write for these next 15. Ah, I think no, it comes down to self-interest for a few of them. I, I don't think there's any doubt that we will have the press against independence for years after independence. And Every time it snows, it will be because of independence. 
Aye, but do you think some of the extremist voices like an Alan Cochrane will have a career? Or will he just sit in London and ruminate Cockers, a disastrous place? Does Cockers even write for the Telegraph now? He still pops up now and again with a polemic about how terrible a country he lives in. Well, I mean, my biggest worry is that we don't have enough removal vans for them <laughs> when the day comes. The removal vans. Eh? As they about that. flee to Englandshire. Nori, did you notice the... Uh, the BAM convention in Trafalgar Square yesterday. All the oh, anti vaxxers right. and freak shows and David Icke fans and... And the fascist flag. Aye, the somebody prominent. was flying the flag of the British Union of Fascists yesterday, which is just outrageous. Yeah, but we've got our own version coming in next Saturday at Holyrood, apparently. It's called the March on Holyrood, saving Aye. Scotland. And they're running buses from all over Scotland. Well, I'm no surprise, mate, when they get... So there's going to be, what, uh, a whole load of very small minibuses that no, most people call... I have no idea. We've got anti-vaxxers, anti-masks, people that, that deny that COVID is any worse than flu, and then all the far right will turn up to support them because they'll be well, they'll, they'll, wonderful. Well, they'll, do you get know, in, they'll get encouragement with the freak shows that we had yesterday um, protesting against the BBC at Pacific Key. There was about 40 of them, and they were... Uh, you forgive me, but they're, they're singing shit karaoke songs that should remain in rotten karaoke pubs in Glasgow and never, ever see the light of day in public. And they're, they're prancing about in kilts that are too long for them, that they've got to bargain shops for 20 bucks and that. And they're does, anybody a else, does anybody else get really annoyed about this calf-length kilt thing? It bugs the living daylight out <laughs> of me, mate. It's, it's, if you can't wear a kilt right, then you wear you in. Well, well, it's all right for you with nice legs. I've nothing to do with nice legs. We know we know <laughs> what length of kilt's meant to be worn it. And when About people have day. got a kilt halfway down past their soap, they, frankly, they deserve to be thrown in the water relief, thrown in the Clyde yesterday. All right. And hopefully their kilt would soak up enough water that they sunk. Kilts, I've got that down now. Um, um, what, what about Kevin McKenna? The well, can, can I just oh, make a point about the demo at Hollywood? Mm -hmm. I hope that nobody turns up to oppose it. Because if they do, the photographs will make the demo look like it's more than 12 people in a dug. Hmm. Well, if they're running buses, I suspect it's going to be more than 12 people in a dug. They've got a big turnout in London. There's no reason why they can't get a couple of thousand in... Didn't it look like they had a big turnout in London? Uh, they had a decent turnout, mate. There was about 30,000 in Trafalgar Square yesterday. Was there? Uh, uh, it was big. But then it's every bum on the planet, mate. It was every freak show group on the planet. You had... Mm. Football, lads, lads, you had everything there. Fans of Farage. As I say, the, the David Icke addressed the crowd, mate. How on earth anybody with any... My fellow lizards. Ever, exactly. How on earth anybody could stand and listen to David Icke? The He's man's got a been huge a, following online. Um, I, I can, mate, but every freak show in the planet. Donald Trump's president of America. Any freak show can get a following. That's true. That's true. Stuart, you were saying. Kevin McKenna, what's the SNP's problem with the working class? And uh, he, he was going on about um, the, the legal problem, the lawyers taking on uh, the liquidators of Rangers. He was having a go at, mm. like, how come rugby are getting a, got a pilot um, stadium I, I, with punters, I, I, football company? I quite liked his article, but he was accused of the the the, um, the SNP of snobbery, and I, th I thought his article was reeking of snobbery himself. You know what I mean? I just and, I think, and then he threw in a he threw in yeah. a real working class hero. I think Chris McElhenney, the persistent working class voice, represents the worst with the poorest communities in Scotland, Port Glasgow and Greenwich. Well, I'm sorry, where I come from, rugby's a working class game. Aye, fair enough. So he's wrong about rugby. Um, oh, only in the borders. Well, well, Edinburgh as well. There's as much working class participation in rugby in Edinburgh as there is public school participation. Well, you should know. I don't. <laughs> uh, there's plenty of joiners, plumbers, and postmen. Aye, not, not, not every egg chaser is called Farquhar. Certainly not. There's even a few Jimmys, Jimmy. Aye, I believe so. 
they're just the ones. They're they're just the ones with the the, the extended shoes that can't play football. Some uh, good Kevin Pring- amongst them as well. You know, Kevin Pringle used to be uh, his, um, Alex Salmon's right hand man, and well, I don't know if he was his right hand man. Jeff Aberdeen was, but he was certainly close to him. And then, of course, he's now a big cheese at Charlotte Street Park Partners. He he had an article which was going on and on about how to get more devolution. Nothing to do with go cow to get independence. So, I mean, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Now, he's, he's a, pr- a strong link with, the, shall we say, the First Minister. Was the gist of an, the article not really don't forget devolution? Was, it, was that the article that said we were going to end up being in a union after independence with the rest of the UK anyway? Uh, that's, I think that's more like McWhorter. It was actually, it actually um, it's a quite a good point he made. It's more like um, uh, yeah, a union of sorts. What he's talking about is deals will have to be done with a, a, between an independent Scotland and England and probably Ireland as well, just to, for simple things like freedom of movement, trade. Well, the template's there with Southern Ireland, isn't it? Aye, I mean, you, you just sit. You just sit doing. Once all the, once everything's over, once the vote is done, sensible heads will prevail because they have to. Michael Gove they, said that. Did he? Aye. Oh dear, dear. But they have to. I mean, they, the British tell the Irish they were up to their ears in hock, and they would be paying them back for decades, and then their, whatever deficit they were meant to have to the UK was quietly written off. Well, I mean, the the big one that hasn't actually been mentioned over this particular cycle of chairs, but was a popular one back in the day, is that if Britain wants to be the successor state, keep its seat, keep all its treaties, etc., they have to take all the debt as well. Well, they've already right. said they would before the yeah. Treasury announced that before the last referendum. Here's the bit. That, here's the bit that from Ian McWhorter. He says essentially, yes, yeah, some kind of a union. Ireland became independent with a nominal debt of eighty percent of GDP. Negotiated it away. Um, talks about possibly leasing Faz Lane for twenty years. But the, the, the best line is, debt is malleable because it is essentially political. Well, no money at I all. Mean, well, that's you back to where we started with mm-hmm. modern monetary theory. Uh, so you, he's, you know, it, it's all the rage. We'll have yeah. a party. It's noticeable how nobody, but nobody, has spoken about the United Kingdom deficit for what two years now. Remember how they were me, paying me. down the debt? They were getting rid of the deficit. That's all that different. Just completely disappeared. That's different. That's like your mom and dad having a mortgage and you wanting to buy a motorbike on the never never. It's different. Okay then. <laughs> it's, like you saying, grown up, it's like grown up money. Yes, Daddy. That. Whereas Scotland's money is a bit like you, as I say, try to buy a motorbike with your pocket money. Do you not listen to the unionists? No, I'm afraid I've not been listening. I've, I've been I, I've been tardy. I've not been paying enough attention to the, the the brainy unionists who would explain these things to me, Norman. Well, give yourself a good smack. I'd rather not. Can I just give myself a good shake? A shake will do it. A shake will do it. Barry. You know who's second in charge uh, at the British Labour Party these days? That Scottish lassie, Annalise Dodds. She's now no. uh, effectively Starmer's deputy. She's the money. She's the, do, handling the money. And she parroted the Labour Unionist position on Jers on uh, Twitter. What a mistake that was. <laughs> uh, she got paid. She got pasted, did eh? She got oh, absolutely pasted. hammered. You know, things like, oh, the nine of the Scottish, uh, nine Scottish councils are run in a coalition between Labour and Tory. Oh, the, the, the list was on and on and on. She was going to be wishing she hadn't opened her bloody gob. Tell her twixt her legs. I said her gob. Well, anything else that really burning issue that you want to bring up? Well, Andy Murray. No, really, no. I thought he, over his... Uh, Hibs comment. Hibbs comment. I can't, yeah. remember. I can't, can't remember who. who, who, who maybe it was. Was John that not Drummond. McKenna? No, it might have been well, John Drummond because I think he's a hippie as well. 
I just see Joanna Cherry and Jean Freeman are having a pop at that Michael Glacken of the Times because he he was a journalist that came out and basically had a real pop at Kate Forbes for screaming and shouting. Basically, without quite saying it, he hinted that she couldn't do her job because she was an emotional woman. Mm-hmm. So I think the backlash on that from... I've never heard him before, Michael Glacken, working for the Times, mm-hmm. apparently a Scotland correspondent, but he, he I, th- I think if you, clicks. Right. Oh, I think if you've once scratched your arse with a bit of heather, you can be a correspondent for the Times and Scotland correspondent these days, can't you? Right. But that reminds me of Joe Cherry making the headlines again. It's her that dug out the, the worry about the law grab. Mm-hmm. I think that, as I say, I think they will quietly take a wee step back from that at some point just the moment well Joe Cherry tends to have a decent track record I think Michael goes probably absolutely quaking in his boots when he hears her name these days yeah, but the trouble is they, they're desperate to curtail the, the powers of the, uh, the judiciary in England and they can't do that without doing Scot- doing Scotland in as well I but they can't do the Scottish courts without having major constitutional issues about it and do they, want, do they want to go down that path and they I do think- it I think we should lay claim, not Joanna Cherry. I certainly brought this up at least two months ago. I could see it coming. They couldn't, Mm. if they went after the review process in England, they had to go after it in Scotland. Um, I think it was part of the power grab. It was, it was absolutely coming. And I hope the reaction to it is as the Scottish government, if you touch Scottish law, you break the treaty. We want to renegotiate it, and the first line in it should be Scotland can have a referendum whenever it wants. Aye, come and have a go if you think you're smart enough. That should be the, the wee chant that we send down towards Michael Gove, because well, genuinely, him and Dominic Cummings think they're smarter than the rest of the planet. And okay. it's a bit time it was shown that they aren't. There, um, there's still a lot of ignorance just on that basis, you know, the, the, the independence of Scots law. That was written into the treaty. Um, the independence of the Scottish NHS, that wasn't written into a treaty, but it was a separate act and it was, it was set up before the, uh, the English NHS. Yeah, it existed before. Because uh, the NHS was based on a model that ran in the Highlands before uh, the NHS was set up. Mm. Um, Highland Health Service ran for the 20s, didn't it? And education has always been independent. As has the Kirk. And the Kirk. So do you think we could get our independence because they start sending up their evangelical nutters for the House of Lords to try and shut down the wee free church? Will we go to the barricades, boys? Maybe they'll start ennobling the wee frees. Jimmy, Jimmy, have a look behind Stuart. What do you think that is? I think he's sitting in a chapel somewhere. No, it, does no, look but, a bit, it, it does look a bit pineapple to me, like. It's, it's very basic. Look, see, it's no, it's, it's no Catholic church. It's more, it's more wee free than Catholic, right? It's more wee free than Catholic, I think. I. Good topic for Sundays. I was brought up in the Kirk. I was 17 years old, running the church youth club, and I had to tell the minister, look, I'm afraid I don't believe in God anymore. And he says, shh, didn't he tell anybody else? <laughs> Sounds like I a thought, rather thought... sensible man. <laughs> I thought he was about to confess, nor did he. Mm. <laughs> I have a funny feeling he wasn't very strong on it either. I'm just here for the manse. I thought oh, I was yeah. going to, I, you see, I thought I was going to have to give up running the youth club. Oh, I'm, right. here for the, I'm here for the cheap, cheap hoose and the once a year trip to Malawi. Aye, that's true. A lot of Scots went out to Malawi in the day, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I forgot about that. That was Jack McConnell's wee thing, wasn't it? The the Aye. aid package with Malawi, that seemed to have done quite well, actually. I saw something last year about exchange students and stuff. It seems to be working. Yeah, but okay, the way guys. McConnell's wearing these days, I'm a bit worried as to his ulterior motives for wanting to get close to young children in Africa. Oh, pinstripe kilt. Oh, dear. Anyway, we've got, um, we've got part three of the... Samad inquiry on Tuesday. Yep, we've got a union leader making his, um, the boy who suggested to people that there was a process in place to keep, to stop women working alone with Alex Salmond, the union leader is going to 
elucidate upon his allegation on Tuesday. So I look forward to that. Well, that should be interesting to see whether he's got any evidence or not. Um, and then, as I say, next weekend, we've got all the knuckers turning up at Holyrood. David Dyke might show up. Um, is, there a fire is there a fire hydrant at the palace, Norrie? Oh, there will be, mate. There will be. Barry, we'll see if we can borrow Chris Law's old fire engine. We'll hose all the clowns doing. The green goddess. I don't think he left mm -hmm. a pump in it. I think he took it out. Anyway, time to go, boys. That's coming up for an hour. Okie dokie. Um, thanks, Stuart Lockhead. Bye bye. Jimmy Hutton. Cheers, mate. Thanks God for be with listening. you. Oh, you naughty edit that out. No, I'm leaving it in. I'm going to cast it up to him. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening, folks. And we'll catch you all on Monday, hopefully. Cheers for now. <laughs>